Judy call the meeting to order, if you would, please. I would. Housh. I am here. The Queen. Whom I've not seen yet. I'll check her later. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Curlis. Here. We're also joined by Public Works Director Johnny Burns, Zoning Administrator uh, Denise Swinger, Finance Director Colleen Harris, and Police Chief Brian Carlson. Oh, and Solicitor Chris Conard is here. All right. Thank you so much, Judy. And um, folks might have noticed when we got on, um, a lot of us had these masks on, um, highlighting the village's commitment to wearing masks when you're around other people. Remember, be kind and think about how you're not only, uh, well, you're mostly thinking about other people and keeping them safe. Um, and I did want to let uh, the rest of our village team know that um, everyone's going to have one of these gator buffs uh, as a face covering with the Yellow Springs logo on it. And uh, you'll be getting those soon. And we do really want to encourage people to wear face masks or face coverings. On a related note, um, and we may have the image to show, uh, some of you may have seen the Be Kind uh, with the mask image yard signs. And um, for those of you that are interested in getting one, I know that the group that started this, which is led by Carol Young, have a Facebook group called um, YS Yard Signs for Masks. And uh, there's information on how you can get one of those and, and donate to support them. Uh, we'll also be sharing that in, in other ways. Um, so with that, uh, I know we've got Melody Kingsley on the line from uh, Greene County Public Health. And so, Melody, I was hoping that you could give us a brief update of where we're at uh, with COVID-19 related um, issues. Um, right now, Greene County has 103 um, cases. Three are currently hospitalized. 20 are under surveillance or monitored. Um, instead of seven days after the last symptoms, uh, we've moved it to 10 days out um, before um, doing any kind of antibody testing um, and 10 days out before returning to any activities. Um, what else would you like to know? You said public restrooms, masks, and pools. Is there anything specific you wanted me to go over? Um, I think just any any updates that you uh, think are relevant, any changes or, or things we should be aware of. Um, with public restrooms right now, ODH hasn't given a green light on having those, but any rest restrooms that are maintained by a facility, um, uh, we're asking that you try to clean it every two hours if possible. Um, I, that would include any uh, restaurant, bathroom, um, if there's like a porta potty, uh, cleaning that every two hours. And if you are looking to reopen a public restroom, that would be something to think about um, needing to do once it is open just to maintain it. Um, masks are always an ongoing thing. Um, I was at the, um, the um, peaceful protest this weekend. And I must say, I was very excited to see how many masks were out there and how many of all of you were out there. Um, but that was the most mass I'd seen in a public setting so far. Um, so I think it's great that Yellow Springs is setting a great example. Um, and we weren't um, giving the people without masks a hard time or anything like that. I know it's been the other way around. So I really like the Be Kind Yard signs that are going around. It's a great message. Um, masks within businesses. I know that we get a lot of complaints. And it's our job to follow up on those. So right now our eyes on all the employees and that's really all that we can focus on. It's up to the business itself to require masks. We do recommend that a business ask people to wear masks, um, but our, uh, we are not able to enforce that um, because it is not mandated at this point. Um, in a restaurant setting, we do require that employees uh, of the restaurant wear a mask, but the cooks do have an exception. Um, anyone that is in 
a cooks, uh, you know, in a grill, you don't want to have a mask for a couple of reasons. And uh, uh, Chief Altman isn't on tonight, but it is a fire hazard. Um, it can also cause excessive sweating, which could drip into your food. So there's different sanitation practices that go on within the restaurant that the, um, the uh, cooking staff must maintain, but they are not required to wear a mask. So if you look into the um, cooking setting at the restaurant of your choice and you don't see masks, um, don't give us a call <laughs> because as of right now, it is actually not recommended that they wear masks. Um, the pool, um, what's the date for the reopening? Is it June 5th? June 5th, correct. June 5th. Um, and then our, our inspections, will we'll have someone inspect the pool at least every three weeks. So one of the main things is in the concession to make sure that people are spaced out six feet apart and that it's marked off, um, that there's someone that can make sure the employees are wearing masks whenever possible. Um, if there is a medical reason not to wear a mask, they just have to let the, uh, the, their manager know why and maybe show a written uh, reason that they don't wear a mask. Um, and then all these establishments that are reopening will get signage from the health department. And I think everyone's been in touch with the health department has received um, signage if you need more. Uh, mainly we wanna display what COVID symptoms are and also social distancing, masks, washing hands, things like that. Um, at the pool, people in the same health, household can go within a six foot, uh, they can be within six feet of each other. So it does not imply if you are in the same household. Um, and the public restrooms there will need to be maintained every two hours. Um, I think that's about it. Are there any questions? Thanks, Melody. Uh, Kevin looks like he has a question. And yeah, I do. Sorry, I was muted and forgot I was muted. Um, there were two things, but I'm only remembering one right now. With respect to uh, cleaning bathrooms every two hours, I mean, I've seen uh, a proposal from a uh, from a company that does that kind of thing. Are there is there a minimum set of standards for how you know to do a thorough cleaning? Uh, um, there there are there is some recommendations in the Responsible Restart Ohio <laughs> documents, um, and I can email those out. Um, but basically, uh, being able to do some sort of um, cleaning and disinfection, um, but going into detail, I can get you that document. All right, I'm gonna make sure we're following that as closely as possible. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Melody, and um, I. I I heard you might stay on the line for a little bit um, in case something else comes up. Um, so with that, I really wanna emphasize um, that Melody shared the, the numbers of COVID-19 related deaths uh, with us. Green County and Yellow Springs has been very lucky. Um, and I think this is why, uh, well, not just lucky, uh, we've been doing the right thing with distancing and um, wearing masks to protect others. And so uh, I, I'm really appreciative. I wanna thank the village team and the chamber and the community foundation for helping to make sure that we've gotten uh, more signage out, more messaging about why it is important to wear masks. And um, I, I think the other thing that I did wanna highlight is that, um, you know, it's just, it, it takes some time to get adjusted as we all know, and, um, and the efforts continue to pay off and are really important. Um, so uh, do we have other announcements? Uh, Lisa Krieger, do you have anything? Yes, I, I have two things. Um, uh, first, I wanna talk a little bit about um, a new program that's called Uplift Yellow Springs. And this is a collaboration between uh, our downtown business owners and the community foundation um, to create a way for uh, people to um, donate money to help keep the businesses um, alive and thriving and going forward. 
Um, for those of you who maybe have participated um, in a Giving Tuesday, um, if you go to the website, that is upliftyellowsprings.com, all one word, you'll see that the website looks quite a bit like that. It has a wonderful video um, featuring the different businesses and um, a call to action uh, to help invest in the future of the village. And then you can click on the logos for the different businesses to make a donation of, of any amount, small or large. Um, and there's also a link to the Yellow Springs Development Corporation Business Emergency Relief Fund um, that you can um, donate to as well. So I know that right now we're all working very hard to help support entities that are struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but if you are able to donate, please consider that. And there's also a link on that site that is upliftyellowsprings.com uh, where you can indicate an interest in volunteering your time. So um, check it out. It's a lovely site. And I wanna say thank you to the Community Foundation. And um, I'm so glad that we're able to help support our businesses this way. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to do was also acknowledge um, our, our justice for George Floyd protest in Yellow Springs this weekend. Um, I, I've been trying to think for, for days of what what the right thing is to say tonight about Mr. Floyd and my sorrow about the whole situation and his family and our country as they we struggle to express our sorrow and rage. Um, today I had the opportunity to hear his brother, Terrence Floyd speak. And I found that really inspiring and one of the things that he said is let's stop thinking our voices don't matter. Not just for the president, educate yourself and know who you're voting for. And that's how we're going to hit them. And so he urged people to protest and in a, in a, in a peaceful way. So I, I would like, Maybe at the end of announcements, I don't know what others maybe want to say, but I would really like to have a moment of silence um, for George Floyd. Uh, I think we should do that now. All right, thank you for, for that, Lisa, and, and for sharing those words. Um, you know, I, I will uh, emphasize as well as Lisa did that the, uh, the gathering we had on Saturday um, was amazing and really uh, showed what our community is about. Um, I was reminded a lot of a village value that we added uh, a couple years ago, um, which states that uh, we will intentionally promote anti-racism, inclusion, equity, and accessibility through all policies, procedures, and processes. And our guidelines for village policing have really emphasized as well um, our commitment to uh, intentional and proactive anti-racism. So uh, this is something that is an incredibly important issue for our community members. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people. Um, over the last couple of days from other communities that uh, and are really upset and appreciate um, that Yellow Springs is, is recognizing this. Um, so thanks a lot for that, Lisa. Uh, do we have any other uh, announcements? Host Way? Thank you, Brian. I have a few announcements. On June 8th, we will have a fire pump testing at a couple of facilities. And this is going to cause some water discoloration. 
also want to advise the public that on June 8th, we will have this fire pump testing, expect some water discoloration. I also want to, this is less of an announcement and more as an advisory. We continue to have sanitary line issues related to uh, individuals flushing things other than toilet paper. So please don't flush anything other than toilet paper. I know most of you that are watching are probably following this advice. So if you can help us get the word out and discourage folks from flushing anything but toilet paper, it has caused some significant issues, not just to our system, but also to other residents creating backflow into their properties. And that's a major, not only is it a health issue, but it's also causes property damage. So your assistance is and support is highly appreciated in its effort. And then finally, uh, so we had an incident at the Glen where we had a young, a young person drown. And, and it's a very sad incident. And I wanna recognize our first responders, including our police officer, Doc, who jumped in with his uniform and limited gear into the water to attempt a rescue. So I want to thank all of the first responders and particular police officer to go in above uh, to try to do all that they can to save lives and protect everyone. That's it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Josue. Um, Brian? So, yes. Yeah, Judy. I just wanted to let folks know that um, Mary Ann's uh, may not make it back to the meeting. She's had a, a personal situation. So. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for highlighting that, Judy. Mm -hmm. um, any other announcements? Brian, I have one more. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, we are simultaneously broadcasting via two channels. We're having some challenges today um, with our YouTube channel. We recently did an upgrade and we're able to simultaneously cast out to the different systems, but we're having some issues on this particular broadcast. We hope to get them resolved. However, we'll make sure that the entire video of this council meeting is up on the on the web. Uh, so, thank you. Okay, yeah, and thanks for, uh, that was my next announcement too, Jose. Oh. I'm glad you mentioned that. So you're saying that our YouTube, this is not being broadcast on YouTube right now, right? Correct. Okay, yeah, I can, I can see that on my screen as well. Um, okay, well, that's a good segue into uh, the next thing I wanna talk about. Um, before giving a brief shout out, I want to thank our village team also for facilitating the great celebration of our 2020 Yellow Springs High School graduates. Uh, I know everybody really enjoyed um, the parade and, and everything. Um, also, there was a great clap out for our sixth graders at Mills Lawn that was also outside and socially distanced. Um, so glad to see all of our students being recognized. Um, so related to uh, Facebook Live, um, we will do our best to monitor the chat, um, but uh, keep in mind that the best way to provide comments is to sign on to the Zoom meeting and you can make comments uh, with your own voice through that meeting. Again, we'll try our best to monitor the chat and, and share things as well. And I believe Josue, if he hasn't already, is going to um, include that Zoom meeting link for anyone that wants to join us uh, via Zoom. Um, the other thing is remember with citizen concerns, which are coming up next, uh, we want you to make sure to flag a comment that you want um, council to see. And, um, and again, the best way to provide comments is through the Zoom uh, platform for meeting. Uh, so with that, we're going to turn to citizen concerns, and uh, we're trying to catch up on everything since uh, we do not have YouTube. Um, so do we have any citizen concerns? Okay. Philip doesn't see anything. Josue, do you see anything? I do not. Not on Facebook. Okay. We don't have anything on YouTube, nothing on Zoom. So uh, if not, then um, we have a consent agenda next, and these are the meeting, uh, the minutes from our last meeting. So I would love to get a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. I'll make that motion. Okay, Laura Curlis, motion and a second. A second. Okay. 
Okay, and Kevin Stokes seconded. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and do a roll call, Judy. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Tausch. Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, next up, we uh, have a review of the agenda. Um, so one of the things that uh, we need to add to the agenda is a brief executive session at the end of this meeting. And um, that is uh, for the purpose of potential litigation. Is there anything else that we need to change on the agenda? Okay. Um, if not, petitions and communications. Uh, Judy, do you want to do these for Marianne or would you like me to? I'll, ha I'll hazard it and then you can just pick up if I've left anything hanging. Okay. We, had num we had a number of letters regarding the pool opening. Um, Judith Hempling wrote in favor of the pool opening. Liz and Dan Robertson uh, wrote expressing their concerns about the pool opening. Pat Peters in favor of the pool opening. Uh, Barb Stewart in favor of the pool opening. Lindy Keaton uh, expressing very specific concerns about the pool opening. Um, and then we received a letter uh, which um, spoke against opening the pool and, and also had a, a petition attached to it. Um, that letter uh, was from a non-citizen and one of the in favor of the pool opening letters was also from a non-citizen. Um, Laura Curlis submitted a letter regarding Solar United um, and I'll leave it to her as to whether she wants to speak further to that. Brian submitted his stay of eviction letter for all of your review that you had uh, agreed to let him write, finish writing last meeting. Mark Carr wrote uh, commenting on the pay to stay ordinance. Um, Lance Hetzler uh, wrote to comment on masks in Yellow Springs. I'm sorry, Lori Asland also uh, wrote and commented against the pool opening for health reasons. Um, and then Mayor Canine resubmitted her mayor's report, which accidentally did not get in the packet uh, for the last meeting. All right, thanks, Judy. I think that was perfect. And um, with that, we're going to move into public hearings and legislation. And first up, we have uh, resolution 2020-19. Um, Judy, let's go ahead and read that in full, please. <clears throat> All right, this is determining the necessity of levying a renewal of an existing 8.4 mil property tax levy in excess of the 10 mil limitation for the purpose of paying for current operating expenses of the village to run for five years pursuant to section 5705.19 as amended and requesting the county auditor to certify matters in connection therewith. Whereas the amount of taxes which will be raised within the 10 mil limitation will not be sufficient to provide an adequate amount for the necessary requirements of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. And whereas in 2015, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio passed resolution 2015-48, which requested the Green County Auditor certify the total current tax valuation of the Village of Yellow Springs and the dollar amount of revenue that would be generated by a specific number of mills. And whereas in 2015, the voters of the village approved a levy for the purpose of raising money for the current expenses of the village at a rate not exceeding 8.4 mills for each $1 of valuation which amounts to 84 cents for each $100 of valuation for a period of five years, commencing in 2015, first due in calendar year 2016. And whereas in order to continue to operate the necessary services and operations of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs seeks renewal of the levy adopted in 2015 to be placed on the ballot at the election in March. And whereas pursuant to section 5705.03 of the Ohio Revised Code, this council is required to certify to the Green County Auditor a resolution requesting the County Auditor to certify certain matters in connection with such a tax levy. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, two thirds of the members concurring, hereby resolves that. Section one, in accordance with the provisions of section 5705.19 of the Ohio Revised Code, Council determines that it is necessary the renewal of the expiring 8.4 mil levy in excess of the 10 mil limitation be levied for the benefit of the village for the purpose of paying current expenses of the village. The renewal millage shall be sufficient to generate the same amount of funds currently collected under the expiring levy as determined by the county auditor and the levy shall be for five years. Section two, council seeks to have the question of the passage of said tax levy renewal be submitted to the voters of the village of Yellow Springs at an election to be held on 
I'm sorry, I have an old version. This is supposed to say November 3rd, 2020. If approved by the electors, said tax levy shall first be placed on the 2021 tax list and duplicate for first collection in calendar year 2022. Section 3, pursuant to Section 5705.03 of the Ohio Revised Code, the Green County Auditor is hereby requested to certify this council within 10 days after receiving this resolution. The total current tax valuation of the village, the dollar amount of the revenue generated by the existing 8.4 mil levy, and the number of mills that will be needed to generate the same amount of revenue for the anticipated renewal of the existing 8.4 mil levy. Section 4. It is hereby found and determined that all formal actions of this council concerning and related to the adoption of this resolution were adopted in an open meeting of this council and that any and all deliberations of this council and any of its committees that resulted in such formal action were in meetings open to the public in compliance with all legal requirements, including but not limited to section 121.22 of the Ohio Revised Code. Okay, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Okay, Kevin, and a second? Second. Second. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So. Okay. Um, Thank you, Brian. And this is a, a renewal, so we're not asking for any tax increase. I think it's essential uh, to renew this tax uh, levy um, as it provides a significant funding for both mandated service and non-mandated uh, human services, such as parks, recreation, streets, pool, and the youth center. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. We're not we're not looking to add any additional taxes. We would do with what has been provided by the taxpayers going back as far as 2006. Hey, thanks, so much, and, and, um, um, I, I would just add, um, you know, I, mean, I think part, part of what most way is leading to is that, that you know, we share that our revenues, our revenues are going to be significantly, significantly impacted. impacted. Uh, the village is keeping the budget, budget balance, but, but the loss of that um, uh, operating, operating levy, levy, which brings, which brings about, about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the village during, during this time, would definitely require us to look at after some services. Um, and I think one, one of the things that's been incredibly important is that, that we're making, making sure that our non utilities, utilities are working. working. We're working to keep them safe during this crisis. And, um, Brian, I need to interrupt you. Brian, yeah. something is seriously wrong with your audio. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Um, but yeah. your your sound audio is just not really coming through at all. It just sounds garbled. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you for that. that. Um, uh, uh, do we have, we have other, other questions or comments or what? Way, how much does it raise 8.4 mills raise for the village? I say in the last couple of years. Um, Colleen's on the line, but I leave uh, over 700,000 in addition to what we're entitled to on the base on the base taxes. And I see Judy nodding her head, and that's the additional per meal. On the levy. That's it. Yeah, it is a great pet talker, right? No, not that. This. Why the trash can getting so many? Okay, we're having some audio issues there. Um, Okay, any, uh, Laura, did I, I can provide you a year by year breakdown of what that additional levy is, and we're happy to provide that to you. Yeah, and, and can everyone, can everyone can you hear me now? now? I heard. I heard. What's that? Still that? Garbled. No, it's it's still garbled, Brian. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yay! <laughs> Let's see if that works. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess what I was saying um, before was that, you know, again, the operating levy brings us about 750000 a year. Uh, given the current uh, decrease in revenues, which we are able to address, if we move to a situation where we did not have that operating levy, we would have to cut services and, um, and, and look for ways that 
we could get down to the essentials. So uh, at, at this time in particular, keeping the services we have in the village, uh, it, this is something that um, we hope the community supports, especially in light of the fact that we're looking at all the ways that we can continue to cut costs. Um, any other questions or comments about um, the levy renewal? Okay. Uh, if not, um, Judy, if you would call the roll, please. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Housh. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up, we have uh, the first reading of Ordinance Twenty Twenty O Seven. Um, Judy, let's go ahead and read that by title only. It's it's a pretty long resolution. Yes, this is Ordinance 2020-07, approving the right of village renters to pay to stay. Okay, hey, uh, can I get a motion? So move. I move. Okay, um, so I heard a motion from uh, Kevin and a second from Lisa. Um, yes. Okay. So let me begin by uh, just highlighting uh, a, a few things about this resolution, which uh, was brought to us for, for the last meeting. Um, the idea of pay and stay is that at any time in the eviction proceedings, you can, uh, if you can come up with the rent and any other amount that you owe, then uh, you can stay in your residence. One of the reasons that this uh, came to us uh, at this particular time is in looking at all the ways that we can keep people safe um, in terms of housing security, food security, et cetera. This was a resource that was suggested that could provide some relief, especially because we know that uh, some of the federal funds for uh, individuals and families are coming slow. We know that the Miami Valley Community Action Partnership is going to be getting uh, some money that will help with housing relief. And so uh, one of the things that I think there was consensus around uh, was that um, certainly as a temporary response, um, this, this would be uh, potentially valuable. We also know that there has been some um, data gathered by the Housing and Security Group uh, that that have told us that we have about 10 individuals that participated in that survey that um, have issues now. And so, uh, so it looks like this is something that could potentially uh, help folks. I do want to add that um, that survey also indicated that the majority of landlords are being very proactive and working with their tenants and, uh, and understanding the, uh, the stress that everyone is under in terms of finances, not to mention mental. And, uh, and it's been great to hear uh, from a variety of landlords, some of whom I've talked to, about what they're doing to uh, help villagers. Uh, so um, with that, we do have, um, Deborah uh, LeBay on the line again um, from uh, Able Law, so she can answer any questions. And so I think at this point, I'll turn to any questions or comments that, uh, that anyone has. Okay. Well, I'll, I, I did have my hand raised in the, uh, in the Zoom. So, um, well, two things. Number one, I'm glad you mentioned, Brian, um, you know, that you said there were at least 10 people that were in this situation. And I'm just uh, sort of referring back to uh, someone that wrote a letter just encouraging us to sort of speak to how many folks have been impacted by it so we can see what the, what the value uh, of this ordinance would be. And also section seven, first of all, the, the ordinance is very well written, very thorough, but section seven, um, says the ordinance shall remain in effect until such time as the governor declares the state of emergency no longer exists. Uh, and at such time, the ordinance shall be repealed. I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, in a, in a, you think about it in the real life situation, 
depending on all the factors that, that impact why someone is having difficulty, I mean, just because the governor says on Monday, everything's okay, and um, you know the, the state of emergency is over, that might not necessarily mean that my situation uh, has been remedied you know, with respect to my inability to, to, to pay rent. So I'm just wondering if there needs to be a little bit of buffer time to allow um, you know whatever you know whatever a family would have to go through to ensure you know their cash flow has gotten back in order you know so that so that you know again the the, the governor doesn't make a statement on one day and then the next day we're back to business and the eviction is still in process. I wonder if there just might need to be some little buffer there in time. Okay, thanks for that uh, comment, Kevin. Uh, any other questions or comments from our council members? Mary, did you want to say anything? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'd like to um, make a motion to amend sections one, two, and three. The very first sentence of each section, it says tenants right to pay to stay. Then it has first thing after filing an eviction, then eviction judgment, and then execution. So right at the end of each of those first sentences, prior to the first parentheses, I'm talking to Judy Kentner now, I'm making a motion to insert the words for non-payment of rent. Because I think what we're trying to solve and help is tenants who uh, have the right to pay to, we wanna say they have the right to pay to stay, if the eviction is for non-payment, which means financial reasons, because there's a whole nother category of evictions that are for non-financial reasons. And I'm, I don't feel comfortable kind of sweeping all those into this pay to stay legislation. So I, uh, that's, that's one thing. So I would make a motion to amend the first sentence of section one, two, and three right before the first paren to put for non-payment of rent. I would second that motion. Okay. And um, do we have any discussion? I, I will start by saying that um, the, the intent is that this is for the reason of non-payment of rent, uh, which is something that was shared with us uh, at the last meeting. So, so that, that should be clear in the resolution as well. Um, any other comments about that? The only other comment, well, I have another comment on section seven. Okay, well, let's go ahead and vote on that amendment then. Okay. Um, all those in favor, uh, Judy, go ahead and call the roll, please. You're on mute. Stokes? Yes. Curlis? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Housh? Yes. Got it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Maura, go ahead. Uh, section seven, just uh, the public should be aware that this shall, it says this shall remain in effect until such time as the governor declares the state of emergency no longer exists. I did get a couple of comments from the public that they weren't sure if this lasted a year or two, you know, two years. And um, just so they know it's during this time of state of emergency. Thank you. Okay. Um, so is that another motion? No, no, it's just a comment that okay. just so people are aware how long it lasts. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions or comments? Can I just get clarification? Kevin, were you wanting to formally amend that section seven? Did you want to make that motion? Well, I, you know what? I didn't really have the, the language. I really just wanted to have a discussion. Um, you know, because again, I don't know if, if folks would be able to get back to normal. Uh, of course, you, we mentioned CAP and other organizations that are going to be working to make people whole. I mean, if that is our expectation that folks will, you know, be in a good place by the time the emergency is lifted, 
so be it. But I didn't, um, I can imagine it might be helpful for folks to have a little more time, but I don't know what the right thing to do is. So that's why I didn't want to make a formal uh, motion of an amendment, but just wanted to, to maybe have a discussion about that. Um, Chris, Chris has got a question. Okay, Chris. Comment. Yeah, I, I want to respond to uh, Kevin's uh, question about uh, expanding the scope of uh, the ordinance, and I think Deborah would agree with this. Um, to uh, reiterate what Deborah said at our last meeting, this is the first uh, ordinance that would get past the first reading in the state of Ohio. I presume that's still true. Um, and ordinarily, because of the way the law is written, but for the state of emergency, uh, this area of law would be would have been preempted as a law of general concern. Um, and so the, the scope of the law, in my opinion, is only valid during that period of emergency. However, I, I, you know, we're, we're in uncharted waters as lawyers uh, and as, as and all of us. We're, we're, we're trying to do what's right. Um, and uh, how this would be enforced, how this plays out remains to be seen. For example, uh, if there were an issue where uh, this ordinance were in effect and a landlord refused to accept uh, payment by a tenant, how would that be enforced? Um, that would likely require uh, the, the filing of an action against the court. Uh, and I presume that that would be done by the lawyer who is representing that tenant because that's an affirmative defense. Um, and so again, I wanna, I, what I wanna say is there's lots of uncertainty as to how this would play out in the future. We hope that it will deter or actually uh, not deter, but maybe encourage landlords to accept that that late rent and that this will never be a, become a problem. Uh, but as the village solicitor, I just have to caution people that uh, we don't know how this will actually play out in practice. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, any other questions or comments? Just wanted, wonder, Deborah, Deborah, want to share her thoughts? Sure, yeah, Deborah. Um, sure, so thanks um, for um, including me, asking me to be here. Can you hear me okay? Because I'm in the country and some of my audio is a little sketchy. Okay, great. Um, so uh, based on my research, it's our position at ABLE that um, villages and cities do have the ability to pass these ordinances even beyond uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in. Um, we believe that um, a, a reading of the Landlord-Tenant Act, that this um, law does not um, interfere with the general law. Um, there, This would really go to what is a, a defense for a tenant um, uh, and so we do believe that this could um, be viable even outside of the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions uh, before we, I think we will take a vote, even though this is the first reading. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, all right, if not, uh, Judy, could you call the roll, please? Yes, Krieger. Yes. Curlis? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Ouch. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, and uh, next up we have uh, the emergency reading ordinance 2020-08. Uh, Judy, we can do that by title only. All right. This is an ordinance authorizing the annual transfer of funds and declaring an emergency. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. And Kevin seconded. Um, okay, uh, so um, since this is, well, let's go ahead and hear from uh, Colleen first and then we'll open the public hearing. Okay, thank you, Brian. This transfer is to put money back to the general fund that we had originally in the beginning of the year uh, transferred from the general fund based on our original budget. Uh, the next ordinance, this goes hand in hand with the reduction of our budget due to 
COVID-19 um, budget revenue estimated losses that we won't be receiving, we are adjusting our budget. So this is a transfer amount that we took from the general fund over into the um, funds listed on the ordinance that we are now going to be moving back as part of our reduction in budget costs. Okay, thank you, Colleen. Um, so I'm gonna open the public hearing and are there any uh, questions or comments from council or citizens? Okay, um, I don't believe I see any. So uh, we're going to close the public hearing and uh, Judy, if you could call the roll. Indeed. Stokes? Yes. Curlis? Yes. Krieger? Yes. <clears throat> Ouch. I didn't hear you, so uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You cut out for a second. Okay. And last piece of legislation is uh, emergency reading of ordinance 202009. Uh, Judy, again, let's do that by title only. All right. This is 2020 second quarter supplemental appropriations and declaring an emergency, Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Can I get a motion? So moved. I move. <laughs> We keep doing that. <laughs> Kevin, Lisa to the punch. So, a motion from Kevin, a second from Lisa, um, and uh, uh, Colleen. Okay, again, thank you. Um, when we started with um, our budget talks, it was the first week of April. Once we realized um, that the income tax was not and other items, other revenue sources for the general fund was not going to be coming in as we had budgeted originally, we started working on reducing our appropriations so we stay in balance. So we talked a lot about the general fund and we came up with the $338,550 that we're gonna be reducing uh, based to stay again in balance with what we're anticipating our revenue source now will be. But we went through all the funds and the total of this ordinance is reducing our appropriations by $512,946. There are breakdowns to every line item that was attached to the ordinance. Um, we're requesting this uh, reduction again so we can adjust our appropriations, making sure that we're not overspending based on our income. The income will be monitored and has been monitored weekly. Um, as you know, a budget is a living, breathing document and it changes. So if we have any significant increases or decreases, we'll come back with another ordinance requesting a, a change in our appropriations. But this, at this point, we feel is a good number. We'd like to get our books adjusted so we can all um, move forward with the amount of money that we can spend comfortably at this time. Okay, thanks Colleen. And, um, Again, since this is an emergency reading, um, I'm gonna open the public hearing. Uh, any questions or comments from council or, um, or a citizen? Yeah, I saw it, that's different. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, this is Lisa. I would, I would just like to say um, thank you to you, Colleen, and to the other members of the team, because I know that this has been a collective effort that everybody had to pitch in and sharpen their virtual pencils and figure this out. So I just wanna acknowledge the work that went into this. Thank you. Okay, thanks Lisa. Uh, anything else? And I yes. second that, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think the, uh, the work that um, the village team has done to look at how we can uh, balance our budget during these crisis times is, has been uh, incredible. Uh, very appreciated. So um, not seeing any other questions or comments, I'm gonna close the public hearing. And um, Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Yes, Krieger. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Ouch. Yes. I thought you were gonna Thank sing you. a song. Okay. Um, next up, we are going to move into uh, old business. So
And, uh, and I, I do know that there's at least one question about the pool, uh, which will come up during uh, the manager's report and, uh, and host way can address that. So um, the first item on the old business is uh, our regular update on village finances. This way. Thank you, Brian. As you know, we, this is an agenda item that's gonna be ongoing until we get through the COVID-19 pandemic as um, the pandemic is having significant financial impacts, not just in the village and the county, but throughout the world. So. Uh, as of as of today, we have not received an update from the regional income tax agency, which is responsible for collecting our income tax. Uh, so we have no new updated model to report on. So uh, we're holding steady with our current financial projections that Colleen just went through uh, thoroughly to the five hundred and twelve thousand uh, dollars that we've made reductions on. So we're still planning on that budget. I want to reiterate Colleen's point that the budget is a living document, and um, as we've seen, this situation is changing, and um, we're not we're uncertain about the future. And given the data that we have now, this is our best projection. So we'll continue to hold on to this uh, projected model until we receive other data from Green County, um, both the auditor's office and the regional income tax agency. Okay. Thanks, Josue. Um, do we have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, all right, then we're gonna move into another topic that will be on our agenda um, as we decide uh, how we are reopening at the village. And so this is related to um, uh, whether we feel that we are ready um, at our next meeting, which would be June 15th, um, to transition into meeting live um, as opposed to virtually. So love to hear any thoughts about that. Um, I have a question and you know it has to do with just i mean my my thoughts about whether we should or shouldn't have to have to do more with um logistics and you know broadcasting and how would we set this up um because i think it's you know it's if we're going into a new phase i think it's going to be a while before we go back to chambers just because of spacing issues so whatever change we make, so for example, if we move into the gym, which seems to me to be the likely next space, I'm interested in what, you know, how to, how can the IT support be there since it will be, you know, probably four months to years before we can go back to chambers. So I'm just wondering about that. Right. Um and uh, I know Josue and the team have worked on this. So Josue, do you wanna talk about that a bit? Yes, thank you, Brian. We've um, we looked at what technology resources we would need to accommodate a meeting and the, and the gymnasium. And we secure both cameras and sound system to be able to have multiple individuals there, multiple audio points without causing interference to be able to broadcast a council meeting to to our residents now with today being the exception that our youtube channel broke down and we can't get that live stream up we hope to work through those uh, but we've gained facebook we've gained facebook audience so we're able to stream that uh, but from the technology end with today being the exception our team has been working diligently to make sure that we have the equipment and we have the internet access um, down in the gymnasium to be able to broadcast a, a meeting from the public, the physical in-person meeting, uh, we have enough space in the gym to accommodate council and several individuals being spread out six feet apart. Um, given our past audience and our, our past participation at council meeting, I think in our busiest in our busiest time since I've been here, which was the uh, my first my first council meeting on the job, it was standing room only. Um, I think we can accommodate that that uh, size of crowd in in the gym, which were about twenty plus individuals. 
So, Josue, I um, guess whenever I've imagined um, what what that would look like and feel like, you know, for staff having to pull in the technology and whatnot, I I first imagined it would have to be setting it up every two weeks and then taking it down. Uh, do you envision it being just a set up once and it just stays there um, on the premise that the gym is not used for anything else in the interim? When developing or or designing our uh, the system that we would use for broadcasting, we were looking at finding the right uh, price point for what would meet our needs and it wouldn't break the bank. Uh, so you may not be able to tell from Brian's feet, but we have an HD conf conference camera on him that that camera will become the multi-use camera um, for all of our video teleconferencing systems. Uh, we would that's portable. It attaches to a computer. Um, and it, it, it was the right, the right solution we needed. So in terms of uh, how we work setting it up, pro it's gonna be a portable equipment. We, we don't see the business case for permanently installing um, high-end HD cameras that have the long, the long zoom view and setting up, setting up a permanent audio solution in the gym. Um, we don't have the financial resources. You heard from Carlene, the significant budget cuts we've had to make. So we're doing we're doing the best that we can with the technology that we have, and so far it looks like we're doing well. Um, so it would it would mean that every two weeks we would bring in the equipment, set it up, and um, and, and dismantle it. There's obviously labor costs associated with with um, having that set up. Currently, I don't think that that labor cost is going to exceed uh, the price point of setting up a permanent solution. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, so I guess beyond that, uh, we probably just need to determine whatever criteria we're going to uh, use for when we <laughs> for when we uh, you know make the decision to to change from where we are, uh, you know to to uh, go back to the point that Lisa was alluding, alluding to. I mean, we don't right now have any idea how long this is going to be going on. Um, you know, so again, I think we just need to maybe consider what, what criteria we use, um, you know, to even make the decision. I have a health question, and I see our, our health district person's gone. Maybe Lisa can answer it. I mean, what's the current recommendation, even if we're in a big room and we're spaced, say, 10 feet apart, do we still have to wear masks? And if the answer to that is yes, then I guess I'm leaning toward not meeting in person because I just think it's too hard to go as long as our meetings sometimes go, which can be four hours talking to each other with masks on. Um, my, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a representative of the health department, but, you know, there would be more than 10 of us in place and I mean I would say yes I would only feel safe um, with a mask I would imagine that that would be what the health department would say as well you know so that's a that's a you know those are two two different sides of the coin therefore the, our criteria could be we don't even consider it until we no longer are required or it's no longer suggested uh, that masks uh, be used. I mean, we, we start there again, just trying to look for some points at which we can start looking that way. Um, there's nothing that has happened in the last couple of weeks that's made me want to change. Although, you know, it, again, it would have to be done with all of those um, prerequisites in place, which I think to Laura's point, it's a bit more of a pain uh, to do it that way. And And right now folks are we're comfortable, fairly speaking, um, and we have a decent audience and barring the technical snafus, you know, we're, we're getting the message out. So again, I'm just saying we just, maybe I'll start thinking about what kind of milestones do we think we need to meet before we start thinking seriously about meeting in person. And, and Karen, well, I One other you. thing that comes to mind is that another, another thing will be if we have immunity. You know, I mean, if 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 we 
at some point have enough access to testing, and if you're immune, then you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> you know, but I feel like um, even though this is imperfect and I worry about the ability to of the public to participate in the same way as they do in person, I actually think it's harder to interpret what we're saying if we are masked. You can't see my face at all. It's not even just the inconvenience of wearing a mask. It's also the loss of, of facial expression that I think helps with communication. Okay. Um, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Kevin. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So I, um, I think I think what I'm hearing is that um, June 15th is going to be a virtual meeting. All right, and um, I guess we'll try another uh, microphone for me. <laughs> um, now that we've ran through a couple, so I must just be uh, burning them up. Um, okay. Is there any citizen comment on that? Has anybody chatted on anything about that? Not about, not about the meeting. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but I guess um, one thing that was pointed out was that um, because of the YouTube, YouTube issue, um, some people were waiting for YouTube and may have had comments with citizen concern. Uh, again, I know one of those is related to the pool, so we'll be talking about that uh, relatively soon under manager's report. Um, but I guess if there are, um, I know the one thing that has come up in the chat from Kate Hamilton is concerns about, um, you know, again, people not wearing masks. Uh, and, and she did ask if there was a discussion about this, which we did talk about uh, a bit at the top of the meeting. Um, we have more signage out, we're doing more messaging, we're thinking about how to address uh, uh, when there are places or where there are places where people are um, gathering and how we keep them spaced out. Uh, and um, I guess if there are any other comments that people would like to make themselves and they're on the Zoom chat, if you can either flag me with a wave or put something in the chat box, um, we can take those now. Okay, and uh, and again, if it's about the pool, we'll be talking about that soon. All right, so I don't see anything. This way, or Philip, do you see anything? So if not, we are going to move into new business, and um, the first item is the uh, no works request for an extension of their um, PUD, and um, I will have I think her sway. Or is that Denise? Denise. Denise, yes. Uh, Denise, okay. I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, do you know the the PUD, the Plan Unit Development Code? Um, it really requires a lot of interpretation. As um, Chris Connard, I'm sure, is aware, um, we've had lots of discussions at different times about um, processes for it. Um, and one of the items, we, we only had a couple PUDs that, that we've done in the last four or five years. Um, and one of them was at Millworks. Um, back in February, um, I sent a reminder to the owner that um, their uh, PUD was going to be expiring. Their 12 month expiration date was coming up April 1st um, for them to turn in their final plan. Uh, they did submit a letter um, asking council for extension of that, um, and it was tentatively set to be put on the agenda for council to consider at your March 16th meeting. But then, of course, that changed because of, you know, uh, postponed due to the COVID and the subsequent lockdown that we had. Um, so the final plan really should not differ from the preliminary plan. And what has passed since that time is that there have been some changes that have taken place that's going to really, as from staff's evaluation, it's going to require a new preliminary plan 
be submitted to the Planning Commission and Council. And um, specifically, that is um, the, uh, the changes to the expansion will, to YS Brewery is no longer happening. Um, we, I just had received a uh, conditional use for a new distillery that we're going to be hearing next week. Um, Tuck and Reds um, is hope, planning to open, and they're going to be using some of the space that had originally been for um, uh, YS Brewery. Now, th that in and of itself wouldn't possibly be enough if it was just, you know, a switching around here or there of rooms. But in the original plan, there was quite a bit of um, uh, changes to the buildings themselves in that there was going to be a separation of the, of the buildings to provide these green corridors so that there would, there's like 600 feet of frontage along the bike path that was gonna really invite people into the um, uh, facility, into Millworks. And uh, that is no longer happening uh, as I understand it. Um, that also has an effect on, you know, that was at one point green space that was considered part of green space, open space. Um, that would have helped with stormwater uh, runoff. And in the end, um, I, I just don't want to see the applicant, uh, the owners come forth with a final plan that they put effort into only to have to be rejected um, because they've got to start over with a new preliminary plan. Um, so what I'm suggesting is to just not have, just, just not tell them they can move forward with the final plan or giving them that extension because they really should come back with a new preliminary plan when they're ready. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, you know, hopefully they'll have it to where they can go move right from the preliminary plan to the final plan. Um, and that will, um, I just think that would be better for them. And, and in the meantime, I would like to suggest that the council not change the zoning or rezone it back to um, light industrial, light mixed industrial, because the PUD, as it was done, really allows for more flexibility into how it can be developed. And uh, rather than going back through that rezoning process as a part of it. And we do have another PUD um, south of town that has been, um, as it's been zoned as a PUD since the 80s, um, rather than rezoning it, if someone does buy that piece of property, they can always come forward with a plan that can either be accepted by planning commission and council, or they may choose to rezone it. All right. Uh, thanks, Denise. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that Jessica is on the Zoom call. So um, so we'll see if, uh, if Jessica wants to uh, add any comments. But before that, do council members have any questions for Denise? I have a question. So um, imagine a, uh, a different time when this had come before us in March. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like, or what I read, it sounds like at, at back in March, um, the plans hadn't changed as much, right? So we, the, the recommendation from staff may have been to approve it at that time. So what happens what would have happened if if it was approved back in March and, and then subsequent to that, the events that um, Ms. Yamamoto described in her document then happened? What happens then with the PUD approval, which would, would be within a year then? Do you um, understand my question? Right, yes. Be, um, uh, mm -hmm. if, they, if they would have moved forward with a final plan, the the concern is is that it might have been rejected by the planning commission because it would have changed so much or staff if, if, if we had dialogue in between that time staff probably would have said to um, the owners that look this is this has so many changes to it um, from what was originally proposed it really warrants a new preliminary plan well, well i think i see what you're saying yeah I think the um, the change that you're talking about would be the brewery and the brewery changing their office. Uh, they changed their tap room, expanding their tap room into office space. And 
I think at that point, you know, there was no real say at where they were going to expand into. So I don't think that changed. You oh, know, there, far... no, the, the, there was a plan and it showed them expanding. We had a whole map that was all done in the preliminary plan. Um, right, but a it... landlord a landlord shouldn't be responsible for a tenant that changes their mind. They They clearly changed their mind and decided, we don't want to expand our tap room. Instead, we want to make more office space. So from a landlord's point of view, like as a landlord, I can't do anything about a, a tenant changing their mind. But as far as a distillery going into that space, there was always a craft distillery as part of the plans for Millworks. Yeah, and, and right now under light industrial, light mixed industrial, you can have both of those uses. I think mm -hmm. the biggest thing for from what I see is that all of a sudden that those green quarters are no longer part of that plan. Opening up those green quarters, which was significant uh -huh. to the bike path, um, because that was going to be the invitation for people to come in off of the bike well, path. It was only one corridor that wasn't going to be added. And the reason why was that when we went back in there, we saw that it was going to be, it wouldn't have been wide enough putting a corridor in there and it would have been a substantial investment. And for office building, for an office building, it didn't make any sense because that wouldn't liven up the area. You know, their original plan, the brewery was to add something that would spark things up there, but adding offices wouldn't be something that people would be able to walk through. Whereas what they were gonna put there was a canning, uh, a canning facility where people would be able to walk through it, um, you know, to access those green corridors. So their new plan didn't make sense with with Millwork's plan, but um, but I think you know I I do agree with your um, with your changing the plan because a lot of the things that were on the plan on the original plan just don't make sense anymore after all the COVID. Um, adding a hostel to Yellow Springs at this point doesn't make any sense because. We have, I think, a lot of vacancies or a lot of availability with the hotel, um, with Airbnbs, and with the um, uh, bed and breakfast in town. So, yeah, I think you know that in and of itself, um, you know, with the businesses, everything that that's happened in March, April, and May has really changed. You know, the needs Absolutely. of the community. Absolutely. And so, and I think for you, I think it would just be, you know. Uh, an issue, a thing for you that it would be really kind of heart wrenching to have to go through a final plan and then have everybody go, "Whoa, this is so different." Let's just start over because what what are you planning to do? Because if you do the preliminary plan and then you move right to the final plan, what happens is there is a document. It's like a, a, a it's sort of like a conditions and and uh, it's basically what we call like a CC and R covenants and and restrictions that are on it. And within that you can, and planning commission can determine what types of uses you can have in there and what types you can't have. And, that, and we never really got to that point. So what did uh -huh. you give you a little bit more flexibility? Had you finally you know, said, well, you would have that children's museum, but maybe there might've been something else as well. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna- For now, you know, now Jessica, it doesn't really Jessica, make sense. Jessica, uh -huh. hold on a second. So I'm going to interject because um, this is a great dialogue, but but I want to kind of uh, bring us back to focus a little bit. Um, so Jessica, am I understanding correctly that you're uh, you're okay with the recommendation, or do you have an issue with the recommendation? I'm I'm totally fine with the recommendation. Uh, okay. The only thing that I didn't have I wasn't okay with was a tenant changing their mind on what their plan was, um, having so much of a, an effect on you know, the extension request, that was okay. it. Okay. Um, but as far as everything else goes, I mean, you know, as far as the plan goes, what the plan was, you know, six months ago or a year ago, and where we're at now with our economy and everything happening in the village, it just doesn't make any sense to move forward with the preliminary plan just because of that. Right, right. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing all that with us. Denise, also, thanks for uh the team doing a thoughtful kind of approach to this um so do we have any other questions or comments uh from council or citizens okay i think yeah. uh i think it's it's a uh, pretty clear um that we've got agreement which is always nice um so uh i 
I guess, Judy, let's go ahead and just uh, vote on um, accepting uh, the recommendation, um, just so we've got some clarity there and subject to your roll call. Okay, so you're accepting, this is to accept staff's recommendation. Yeah. All right, Curlis? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Hausch? Yes. Thank and you. I just want to clarify really quickly that that recommendation includes leaving the PUD zoning, correct? Yes. That was, that was part of staff's recommendation. Yep. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's nice seeing everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, how do I leave? <laughs> Come on. Um, I think I was on mute. Uh, so we um, had this discussion about some of the issues we have to look at for our policy related to um, landlords' responsibility for utilities. And um, Laura uh, talked with me about um, you know this being a big topic and that um, she wanted uh, council to think about whether it makes sense to have this uh, be initially uh, looked at by a committee, uh, provide recommendations so that council can have a more focused discussion around this. And um, I thought that was a good thing for us to take a look at and see if that would be a more effective way to structure this discussion. Um, Laura, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, a uh, couple things. Um, when I was village manager going on seven years ago, the, un, the aged accounts amount was about the same as it is now. So nothing's moved on that. And I think we should just make a decision one way or the other. There are a few options about what to do with that. And obviously a lot of people have a lot of input on, on that, but you know, that this situation could go on for decades if, if a decision isn't made so and then in general maybe look at how people are doing on their utility payments i know that hostway keeps us updated but where that might be going and um, what relief we can continue to provide to folks um, and just look at the issue in general but in particular that large group of aged accounts thank you all right, thanks, Laura. Um, any other thoughts around um, this proposal? Kevin, any thoughts? No, sounds like a, a, a positive. I think it's we we want to be in front of this. I, I know we've you know made decisions in the past, and you know things have changed. So I think doing something is better than doing nothing. So yeah, if we want to move forward. I, I support that. And uh, Lisa. So I hear two different issues. And so perhaps the proposal is that both these issues are evaluated by a committee. One has to do with the policy about who's responsible for utility bills should a tenant default. And then the other I heard has to do with what to do with this money that's just been carried along on the books. Am I getting that right? Yep. Well, my proposal was was about the about the aged accounts and what to do about them. Not necessarily. Currently, the policy is um, you know that ultimately the landowner is responsible for what goes on on their property. It's not that they're necessarily responsible for tenants. They may not have tenants, but that they're that. The property owner is the only one who can control uh, the what utilities are there, who's using them, uh, when action needs to be taken regarding those utilities. 
And what most jurisdictions do at some point, usually once a year, the auditor accepts a certification of assessments for various overdue bills to the tax rolls. And that's one way to deal with it. Another way is to sell the aged accounts to a collection agency. Another way is forgiveness or part of all those things. So I really wanted to focus more on dealing with this past due debt that's sitting on our books one way or the other. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Laura. And so, so Brian, you were, it was, then it was you, you were recommending that we look at that policy because that's what I understood that you said first. Yeah. And so I actually, okay. I did not understand that, that that was, you know, Laura was focusing more on the, um, the other piece of, you know, collecting or not collecting those debts. Um, to me, I guess what was compelling is, uh, you know, just kind of like not having any starting point uh, around a pretty significant discussion, um, like a, a temporary or a permanent policy change um, is difficult to do at a council meeting, whether it's live or virtual. I guess to me, options for how we deal with, um, you know, getting the, those accounts off the books I mean, that could also be a committee, but that also seems like something that the village manager could bring us recommendations and we could deal with that in a little bit more of a, a, a focused manner. Um, but I think the ultimate point, and I know this is related to some of the discussions around the, uh, the committee about uh, council committees, is moving into a zone where um, we have some starting point to help focus our discussion. Um, so I, I'm prioritizing because I think we owe uh, the community a response about what we're gonna do given our, our change in utility positive uh, policies with COVID-19. Okay, so, um, all right, so so where does that leave us um, around this uh, recommendation or topic? So, so, so would we just ask the village manager to uh, present, uh, make make recommendations and would part of the deliberation that the village manager go through be hearing from other people, i.e., uh, you know, a a, a manager's uh, subcommittee. I forget what we call it. It's been so long since I've met <laughs> as part of one, but um, you know, but uh, but but would Josue, you know, form some sort of ad hoc committee to just you know get some feedback and whatnot, and then just present council with some recommendations. So I think about this. Uh, kind of like the um, finance investment committee um, where we had two council members uh, work with uh, Colleen, our treasurer, Judy Kittner, and Josue um, to vet some things around, you know, did we want an investment consultant? And then we brought that to council to deliberate on. Um, that's what I kind of envision in this case. Uh, a couple council members um, with the relevant staff members uh, to process some of this detail. And then of course we would have a, a, a full discussion at the council meeting. I would agree, Brian. I mean, I think this is a matter of council policy of, around this issue. Right. Um, and I think council needs to develop a solution, a policy to solution to it. Obviously, with the help of staff and I did an ideal world, it would be true. Tr and we may still have Zoom meetings, but to have in person meetings where the public could attend and provide comment, we'll still do that, obviously. But so if if I'm happy to be the only council person. If somebody wants to join me, I'll ask Josue and Colleen and um, 
any member of the public who would, is keenly interested in this topic to be involved in discussions around formulating a policy, looking at some solutions. Uh, oh, uh, again, if, if you're tasking me with revisiting the whole issue of ultimately uh, who's responsible for utility deficits on a certain property, um, we can do that. I'm not, I wasn't going in that direction. I'm more concerned about just every time we get a, a report on the utility finances, we have this big over half a million dollars worth of, of accounts sitting there. And I just think we ought to make a decision about what to do about them. And it's only going to get worse if we don't start looking at how many accounts are aging toward that number. Yeah. And I, and I agree that we should deal with that as well. So, um, so potentially, you know, this, if, if council agrees that this is a good approach, um, the, this committee could do both. Um, and I guess I want to be clear that, you know, currently what we're addressing with the, uh, uh, the utility policy is, you know, initially making sure that we um, address the changes that the village has made so that, you know, we keep everybody whole. Um, and, uh, and, and so that may, you know, mean something more temporary uh, rather than changing the whole policy. But I think that's part of what those recommendations would cover. And Brian, I, I, I think it would be good to keep the two issues separate because on the arrears or the, the age receivable, we'll, we'll need to do some more research as to see which ones are still within the six year period. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that is over six years, we missed, we missed the collection period on that. We can't sue for that. So we, were, we, were, we would have no choice but to write that off. I think a policy, let, uh, decision needs to be made on wh how, what are we going to do about overdue debts, how collectible they are, and are we willing to sue or sell them to a, to a debt collector? Right, right. So I, I think that the, that conversation is very sp specific and it's separate from how do we adjust to the challenging times under COVID pandemic and the financial impact that it has on uh, on the utilities. Yep. And I'm happy to I'm happy to provide a recommendation on the age receivables that half a million dollars there. To me, I find that there's that's a much clearer process for us to go through and issue a a um, a recommendation. We recommend collecting on it. We can recommend a range of what uh, point that we sell the debt. But I think at minimum we need to try to collect on it because we owe it to the ratepayers to try to collect on that money. Yeah, I, and I agree they're, they're separate issues. Um, and then I think the question is whether we want a committee to tackle both of those, none of those, one of those. Um, and, uh, but I agree with you. I think their, their approach is different. So, so Josue, you said you'd be comfortable making proposals regarding the age receivables. Uh, what are your thoughts, you know, regarding the policy and uh, responsibility for past due? Okay. The ultimately, we need to have a vehicle in place to be able to co uh, collect on any defaults. I see Colleen has her, her hand up, and she would uh, like to weigh in. So, Colleen. Thank you. I'll keep it really brief. Um, most of the receivables of that 500,000 are, are very, very old. When the software was converted in 2016, um, or when the policy, I'm sorry, changed to where the landlord landlords were responsible, that um, moving forward, we have an excellent collection uh, rate. The landlords are responsible for their tenants and the property owners, we do do the tax assessments um, if need be, but our collections have been very good and very tight that half a million are, are just very, very old. There's probably some that we can work on trying to, again, collect, but um, they, they're from 10, 15 years ago, just never got wrote off, um, very, very old. So that's kind of our update. Moving forward, we have an excellent procedure and process. 
the old is just hanging there and needs to be worked on. Well, if it's that simple that there's a big chunk that's not collectible, why don't we start with bringing legislation next time to write those off? I don't know what that number is. Okay, but we can if, review. We, we're going to review those numbers. Anything that's over six years old, we'll, we'll make the recommendation to write those off. And anything less than six years old, we're going to recommend to, for, to sell them to a debt collector. And we can set some parameters in terms of the timing. Right now, this is probably not an ideal time to pursue debt collection. Well, let's, let's come back next time with that recommendation and then see where we are and what the numbers look like and what's happening with the accounts. That's what I would ask. Thank you. Okay. So that, um, that resolves the issue about, you know, what, what we might potentially write off. Um, what's the feeling around <clears throat> trying to work on this uh, policy issue with uh, landlord and tenant utilities? It's a challenging conversation because from a, from a, to protecting our ratepayer and ensuring that we're able to collect and not repeat the mistake that, that we have today that's represented in our books by age uh, receivables of, of half a million dollars, we need a policy to hold the landlords uh, accountable for any defaults. Um, yeah, it's well, I think, I mean, but I think while we're, I mean, to me, we're focused on what do we do given this temporary change that was triggered by uh, us being more uh, uh, relaxed about collecting utility payments. So that's that's where there's been a change because prior to that, we built in protections um, so that landlords can manage that cost. So I feel like you know we're talking about at least in the short term. Uh, something temporary that would address uh, that issue that was caused. Yeah, one of the one of the suggestions that I uh, that I have is that immediately upon the lifting of the immediate emergency orders that we institute an automatic payment plan or have one option of a payment plan that will be subject to the landlords um, approving. Uh, Right now, one of the things that we've contemplated as a contingency to help our residents catch up with their utilities is to offer a six-month payment plan. This is under the expectation that the emergency order will be lifted in, in July, and we have good indication that July 1, a lot of the, the restrictions are going to be eased. We're not going to be completely out of, a, of an emergency, but you know, we've seen businesses are getting back to to standard operations. We've seen courts start hearing um, some of their cases, some of their um, eviction notices or whatnot. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a July 1 date where we would offer a six month payment plan for any utility customer that's in arrears. That way they get to spread out anything they owe up to that date for the next six months until December 31st and any new utility uses gets paid through the regular process. And that's one option and, and we'll work with the, with the landlords to see if that's a feasible plan. Is that a way to manage their risk? I think uh, it does allow for some management of risk. If, they're, if they default on those plans, then the landlords could um, reconsider their options. But that's one idea that we have. But it will be, you know, for us, we, we have to look at, we, we're taking our fiduciary responsibility uh, serious in this matter. We are looking at income tax losses. We've, we've got some um, age receivables on utilities. At some point, it's unsustainable for us to carry, to carry the a significant outstanding balances because in some of our utilities, we have to pay that cost. Electricity, we buy it from the market and we sell it to the customer. We have to pay our bills. Um, when they become due. We gotta pay staff to pump water and do all the things that we do. So we have a fiduciary responsibility and you know, we need to weigh all those things. So that doesn't get directly in an answer, but it is one option that we have that we have to bring to the table. Okay, so based on what I'm hearing, <clears throat> um, I'm, not, I'm not hearing uh, uh, 
any clarity around this committee idea. So why don't we approach it this way? Um, I, since I was involved, I was on council during the time of that decision. I think I've got some historical knowledge that could add some value. So I'm gonna propose that, um, that I work with Josue and Colleen to help kind of put together uh, information that would help council make a decision at a upcoming meeting. Um, that work for everybody? Any other, any concerns or thoughts? Okay, um, but yeah, I, I agree with Josue, and that's why this was brought up uh, last meeting, that um, we should address uh, this and you know make sure that we have some clarity for for folks that are are concerned about this issue. Um, okay, so the last piece of new business is um, an introduction to start, stop, continue. And uh, Lisa Krieger, I'll let you take that away. Sure. So um, start, stop, start, continue. Doesn't matter which way you, which order of things that you say those. Um, I, it came to mind for me because we are in the midst of a continuous change experience. And I, I think that it is, uh, would be false thinking uh, to think that on a certain date, we're gonna be able to flip a switch and return to processes and ways of working together just as we did um, before the COVID-19 pandemic. And so Stop, Start, Continue is used extensively in um, team building and performance building. So it's, it's not um, only about um, fixing anything that's broken, but it's also used um, extensively to help um, individuals and teams to collaborate and to think uh, both retrospectively about how things were done before, and then so to devise, um, devise strategies for future action. And uh, the way it helps an individual is that um, you could use this as a tool for self-reflection about the way you do your work. And in fact, that's how the process starts, even if it's a team um, approach, is that individuals spend time um, reflecting on how work is done and thinking about how it might be done differently. Um, completing this, the goal of completing this is to um, help both individuals and teams to be more productive. And, and in particular, I've always appreciated that it can um, deepen collaboration because we all have different styles and ways of being. And sometimes we don't realize that the way um, we are interacting would be something that a colleague would be like, you know what, stop, right? <laughs> you just don't know it. And, and maybe it's not something that you even feel that passionately about. Um, but it's always helpful, I think, for groups to hear feedback from each other about, you know, what they should stop, start, or continue. Um, I I think that it, I've seen this work with people who just hate any kind of collaborative or team bonding exercise. People who the minute you say, okay, we're gonna have an activity, they're like, I'm done, right? Even those people tend to like this because it can be very actionable and uh, be completed pretty quickly. The hard part though about it is to figure out what you're going to um, focus on. So. Uh, this could be used to think about um, how we uh, run our council meetings and um, how we manage to do this online. It could be used to look at budget strategy. Um, it could be, I mean, I, I, Josue mentioned to me that he has used a similar thing in his prior um, career. Uh, so it, he may have some ideas about how it might be used with um, uh, the village team. Uh, so there's, you know, there, there's some formal roles. Um, people do some reflection in advance once they know the topic. 
and then it becomes kind of a, a group facilitated session. I've done these online. It's not as um, uh, enjoyable and fast and furious when you have to do it online because it's hard to see what everybody else is writing, but there's um, ways to do this. And um, so I just wanted to bring it forward just in case there was interest or if there may be a particular um, type of work or activity that's on people's minds as we start to plan for next year. We'll be here before we know it. Um, participatory budgeting we had talked about. We might be able to do something with that. So, you know, I don't have a, a definite focus for this activity right now, but I wanted to in introduce it to the team. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I, I mean, I'll just, you know, say first that um, for me, this really resonates related to our discussion at our retreat about, um, you know, kind of the, the different roles that council plays uh, versus the village manager and the village team. And uh, I, I think it would be uh, really interesting, especially now um, that Postway has been here a while um, to start to look at that, you know, as we have time, um, or maybe even now with some of the issues you brought up uh, about, you know, how we um, better do the things we do. Um, so I appreciate you bringing this to us. Uh, any, any questions or comments? Well, Kevin? as always, I appreciate uh, Lisa's contribution to the group. Yeah, I do think this can be done informally now, um, you know, just on an individual basis if nothing more than reflection, individual reflection about how this would work or how it would look for us <clears throat> as a team. And we, we do want to think of ourselves as a team. Um, but then formally, um, you know, I, I think it, we should be more intentional about it, um, you know, in a retreat type format, whether it's live or, in, or you know, online or in person. Um, but either way, I think there's it can yield some fruit. Um, perhaps the biggest milestone or biggest hurdle is going to be, you know, taking the opportunity to uh, con consider what we should do differently, you know, when we get back to whatever normal is going to be. Um, you know, I don't, I use the phrase new normal, but, you know, it almost gets <clears throat> overused sometimes. Um, but, but for lack of a better phrase, um, it's, it's, it's sometimes noteworthy or, or worthwhile to take advantage of that change. A change is coming or a change has occurred, whether we like it or not. And, and we should take this opportunity to try to be better at the end of this, whatever better is or whatever different is. Um, so again, I, I think there's, a, there's value whether we do it individually now, informally, or again, in a formal manner, however we can do that at the end. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, Laura, anything that you wanna comment on? I trust Lisa. I mean, um, I don't have any experience with this tool, but it sounds like it has potential to be a good management evaluation tool. And goodness knows when you're dealing with such change so quickly, flexibility is important. So. Yep, yep. Um, Oswey, anything you wanna add? Oh, I, I'm familiar with the process. I've enjoyed myself and, you know, as as you all know that I reach out to you on on uh, various channels to ask you, hey, you know, what do you want to see more of me? What do you want to see me stop doing? It's part of a uh, feedback is important and expectations important. And I think this tool is in, in process. It's effective at getting those two. You know, we we often go through our day and making assumptions about how someone felt or how someone responded to um, either a statement that we made or, or a request. And we really don't know unless we ask. And this uh, adopting such a tool give us an opportunity to have a, regularly, uh, a regular process to ask and to check in. And in the management and direct management function, I've used this in the past and it's, 
what do you want to see more of me? What do you want to see less of me? And what do you want me to stop doing altogether? Um, that same, same process. Great. So I think, um, you know, I think a, a next step is maybe to, um, you know, Lisa, you and Josue maybe to talk a little bit about, um, you know, when timing wise, it might make sense to um, uh, take some action with this. And, uh, and, you know, maybe let's talk about that soon. Do you have I would welcome questions? that. Great. Great. Yes, I would welcome that. Yeah, thanks. Because I think, again, one thing you really highlighted is even though there's a lot going on, this this could be a good time um, uh, for, for some of this uh, discussion and work. So thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, I think we um, – We'll probably have plenty to talk about with the manager's report. Um, and I know that there are a couple of questions that came in. Um, so, Josue, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian. I, I think I have a short report here. Um, all right, quick updates on the COVID-19 um, response and update. We, all of our essential services have continued uninterrupted. We have not had any illnesses or any delays or any injuries in our team. So that is working, is working well and really appreciative of all that our team does to ensure it an efficient um, and productive team. So that's going well. Um, likewise, we've continued our communication strategy to maintain or inform our residents of latest development. Um, and this includes the virtual town halls, the weekly leader calls, the social media presence and digital signs at the interest of Yellow Springs. And this year we've, uh, I'm sorry, this week we added the additional mask on YS uh, uh, signage that's around town. So that's six new signs that are three by four. And we hope that um, we can have a measurable impact on how acceptable and encouraging wearing mask is in Yellow Springs. Our public restrooms are closed. Um, on the recommendation of public health, we can't meet that guideline. and. You know, you've heard me talk about guidelines and work diligent to make sure that we're meeting them all. And if we find a way to meet the guidelines, we will, we will do what we must. Um, this one, unfortunately, still remains a guideline that we're unable to meet due to the financial burden that cleaning these restrooms in such a timely manner um, requires. In this report, I have included a, an estimate from Cintas, one of our vendors for cleaning and cleaning supplies. And as you, if you've read through the report, you'll see that it is very costly, uh, up to $1,200 a day to have our public restroom clean at that, um, to meet the guidelines. We are thinking of an alternative proposal. We're not ready to unleash, uh, release that. Um, Johnny has come up with a great idea about limited hours uh, for the public restrooms and we can accommodate some of the staff schedule. So we'll bring that um, to council in two weeks, or you know, if it's feasible, we may roll that out as the as we've seen uh, an increase in visitors to the downtown area, whether they're residents or not residents. So we're thinking about it. I want you to know and be assured that we continue to think about the public restrooms and how we can accommodate all the individuals that have a need for a public restroom in the downtown area, whether they're shoppers or they are uh, folks engaging in the recreational activities. So that's still, we're still working on that. The all parking lots are open. As you know, the public uh, pool is scheduled to open on May 5th. We are excited to announce that we passed our pool inspection on May 26th, so we've met all the guidelines. Uh, just so you know some of the guidelines that we've, or some of the things that we've done in the pool to meet all the guidelines. We've added an additional barrier to the area where our employees work. So there was a, there's a window in a wall between our employees and our customers. We've added an additional exit gate on the rear of the, of the bathrooms on the, on the left-hand side of the entrance. So we've got a new dedicated gate that would facilitate the turnover of the um, customers at the pool. We've updated our operating procedures. We've included that. That is a draft report. You can see an outline of what are the actions being taken by staff at the, at the pool. We've done a preliminary evaluation of financial impact of the resident only days. 
uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I believe, Brian, that there's a question on, on, the, on this particular item in, in Facebook. Uh, right. we're, lo we're looking at some significant revenue losses with those resident-only days. And here's our reasoning. We've had uh, 135 annual passes that are purchased on a normal season that are for residents. A lot of our daily passes have come from non-resident visitors to the pool. So if the numbers keep um, for this year in terms of engagement, we would expect somewhere up to 135 resident uh, participants would, that would come to the pool. And a, that's about our capacity for the pool on any given shift. We have a capacity of 125. We've traditionally had 135 residents by annual passes. I don't think 100, all 135 will be in at one time. So based on that number, we are reconsidering the two-hour sessions for the pool on those days. Um, we just, there's, we're not going to see a whole lot of turnover and a lot of demand those days because it would only be residents. Um, so there's um, some additional revenue losses there for us. Um, as a direct result of resident uh, only days. Now, I'm saying all of this not to cause any conflict or, or, or raise any alarms. It's just I must report to you this, that if we were already operating the, the pool at a loss during a regular year and with additional costs under a COVID uh, pandemic, now that we've made, made it a resident only days, we expect additional revenue losses. Uh, so that's a direct answer to um, questions we received not just here on Facebook or here in the session, but offline that we are driven by money to open in the pool. And that's absolutely not true. We are not driven by money to open the pool. Not this season, not any season and in, in, in the previous year. So they, we are driven by providing an opportunity for individuals who rely on the pool, not just for physical activity, but to maintain a healthy mind and spirit and body. Uh, so that's on, on regarding pool. So I, I did prepare a statement and I would like to read it because um, you know, we've received some criticisms regarding the pool. Over the last few weeks, I've heard from residents and non-residents of concerns of opening the pool. I hear you, I understand all of those concerns. My chief function as a village manager is to serve the best interests of all the people, to execute government services in the safest and efficient manner and to provide counsel with policy proposals that are based on facts and recommendations from experts and public health officials. The public health authorities have provided guidelines on how to operate the pool. Our team has worked diligently to ensure that we exceed the recommendations and the guidelines for the pool. If I had any doubt as to our ability to design operations of the pool to meet those guidelines, I would not propose opening the pool for the season. There is an element to operate in the pool for a safer experience that depends on the commitment of pool users to follow the rules and recommendations. I acknowledge that the enforcement of the rules may, may, may be more difficult than we anticipate and it may disproportionately affect younger patrons and members of select groups. Um, but I believe that it is best to work through these issues rather than to close the pool outright. We're in this together and together is to we can this too can be resolved. I also recognize the enforcement of the rules and or operating pool in a safer manner may become impractical. If and when that time comes, we will close the pool. All right. Mr. Um, yes. Sorry. Just related to the pool, can you clarify the distinction between the how we're dealing with the restrooms at the pool or let's say who? versus um, some of the challenges we have with the train station? So the difference is that in the pool, we are adding additional staff, we're adding gate attendants, and we have staff there. We have folks that can help cleaning. So with the two-hour schedule, everyone will be asked to leave, and we have the supplies, we have the resources there that as a team, we could sanitize the facility. With the public restrooms, we have one maintenance staff to not just take care of the public restrooms, but they take care of the entire building here, the police station uh, and other resources. So it's, it's just a different way of operating the facilities. Um, the Could you also, 
I'm sorry, did you also say it's it's the fact that, um, I mean, the way that the restrooms are built at the pool is different and facilitates? Yes, yes that is also a, a big difference. At the pool there, the bathrooms are designed to be exposed to water. It's a pool facility. You could hose this facility down. That's not something that can be done in, in the uh, restrooms um, at the train station. Could we do it? Yes, but it's not designed in that way. And uh, I have Johnny on the line, who is our facilities uh, director among many uh, hats he wears. Johnny? One, another big thing is, is we will have somebody at the doors of the restrooms, Brian. So no more than two people will be allowed in the restroom at, at the same time. And the showers and the changing room will be closed. So it's go into the bathroom, wash your hands, come right back out. And then at the two hour limit, then they'll go in and sanitize those stalls and sink. Thanks for that, Johnny. And Thank you, Brian, Brian, for bringing that up. One of the concerns that we've had is, or that I've heard is that we're not letting people use the bathrooms. Not true at all. Bathrooms are there. We encourage folks to minimize their use of the restrooms because that is a high uh, contamination area. The risk uh, of getting something to pull is not in the chlorinated water is the use of restroom. Okay. Um, Hostway, did you have anything else you wanted to cover? I do. I have a Verne cleanup follow-up. Uh, we've met with the US EPA team on May 27th. The EPA evaluated our water source protection data and determined that the contamination at the Verne does not pose a risk to a drinking water source. Um, however, an update to the time of travel uh, map will benefit the village as the water plant has upgraded its, its pumps to produce 350 to 400 gallons per minute. Um, our pumps are producing around 615 gallons per minute for a total production of 750 to 400 gallons per day. So on the initial design, there were a lot more pumps running at once. And the time of travel assessment is based on all these individual pumps running at a lower flow rate. We now are running fewer pumps at a higher volume per minute. And this may have an effect on the time of travel. And so while it's not being required, it wouldn't hurt to have an updated time of travel uh, map. So we would, we'll continue our work on that, on that, um, on that project. Soil testing results, um, uh, I reported previously that we had requested Renee do additional soil sampling on, around the utilities in this area. We have water, electric, and sewer. Uh, the team did that testing and the results are that the testing levels do not exceed the CSAT standard that would pose a risk to utility resources and workers, except for the hotspot that's already determined to be uh, where the contaminated soda will be removed. So all else, um, the contamination is not at the level that would marry additional action. Finally, the statement of basis, which is the final recommendation for the, the EPA to Renate on a, on a agreed final remediation plan, that timeline has shifted to later in the year. Um, this is a direct result of, of COVID, um, but also the additional things that we've asked of Renee uh, to do, and they've happily obliged by uh, doing the additional sampling and getting us those memos around the utilities and the exposure to workers. Administrative updates, we've had a staff transition. Rufan is no longer with us. Um, as a result, we're looking at a redesign of our HR program and services. Uh, this is being done to ensure that we have, we become a, an employer of choice and that we are providing, we are a supportive workplace for our employees who, if there is an asset that's valuable to any organization, it's greatest asset to our employees. Uh, so we wanna make sure that they're supportive and, and we have a, an HR program that not only meets the employees where they are, but it also drives performance for us to have performing efficient and providing quality service organization. Uh, so that's in the works. The police department had significant challenges at the Glen during this reported period. We've had a, we've had a suicide and a drowning of an 18-year-old. 
Um, as a result, we're going to increase some of our enforcement of trespassing on the property and other criminal activity. Um, we find that this is necessary in an effort to curtail some of the behavior that's happening in the Glen. Facilities, we continue to have a fire panel issue, which caused delay in opening the John Bryan Center until further notice. Um, we hope to have that matter resolved in the next uh, couple of weeks. With partnerships, Brian, thank you for the acknowledgement on the high school graduation and parade. It was a successful event. Um, and um, finally, included in this report, we have a proposal for crosswalk design for Xenia and Short Street. I've included two photos. Um, our team did a great job at doing this rendering. Uh, those four posts are designed to enhance the safety of, of pedestrian crossings on the road. Uh, it helps reduce uh, calm traffic. Um, the look and feel of it is designed to blend in with the light poles and other things in, in this area. In the area, I think it looks great. Um, this is a proposal that we're looking to execute. And with that, I conclude my report. All right, uh, thanks, Josue. And um, I guess, first of all, let me ask, uh, there are a few questions that I think will circle us back to a couple issues, but let me ask council, any questions or comments related to Josue's report? I have a question about the proposal for the bright neon signage and uh, the amount of it. And also it looks like there are additional posts that are gonna go into the landscape. They look like they're powering some lights that are supposed to be flashing. I'm not sure when. Um, I'm concerned about the visual impact of this on the downtown. <clears throat> it's a, they're meant to be distracting signs because they're meant to attract attention. The lights, of course, we have residents downtown, and, and I'm concerned about additional poles. One of my issues is uh, visual clutter uh, in the downtown because it takes away from attention on business signage. I, I honestly think we have too many signs in the downtown that are unnecessary, and I'm very much concerned about these extremely bright signs. I think there are other ways to deal with this. Um, I just, I don't think it's necessary at this time. Thanks, Laura. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, well, okay. I, had a, I had a question, thanks, Brian, um, about the pools. When, uh, Josue, if you're, um, you're gonna extend or change the hours for residents on those resident-only days, uh, Somewhere in the mix, uh, does it might it make sense to offer you know a reduced cost annual pass for residents just for convenience? As we think through this, with the doing away with two hour sessions, you know, it does have an effect on how we think about pricing. Um, the annual pass comes back into the mix because that's just a better way to manage that um, that emissions. We only expect 120 people, um, or up to 135. The two-hour session doesn't doesn't really come into play. It's not uh, feasible. So, short answer is yes. We are thinking about that annual pass. That that in, from an administrative perspective, that is just an easier way to manage that that uh, customer base. I've also received um, communications from individuals who are lap swimmers uh, and who come in for 20, 30 minutes at a time, and that's it. They're, they're only coming for that short time frame um, within the 11 to 12 o'clock, so they're not even there for a full two-hour time span. Uh, I've also heard from pool walkers, same thing. They're only coming in for 30 days, and uh, I'm sorry, 30 minutes, and this is at the recommendation of their physician or therapist or whatever, that this is part of their their uh, health maintenance routine. So as we as we walk the work through these processes and figuring this out, we're peeling back the onion and discovering, all right, there's this other issue that the two hour session, the coupon and the pay per session just doesn't work for for the 
the audience for our customer base. Um, so it's it's very difficult um, because we want to provide a quality service, and you know we also don't want to nickel and dime people. We don't, we've got a dedicated customer base, and um, where where we thinking about that that pool emissions rate, I. I'm, I'm troubled that, you know, we went through such extensive conversation early on that we wanted to set this new rate. And now that we've reviewed the impact of the resident only days, it makes le less sense to have those two hour fees for admission. So, um, we're leaning, in short, Kevin, we're leaning towards those annual passes just because I think that the difference that we can make on the finances, um, on those days, I think was negligible. We're not gonna have those uh, non-residents paying any rates during that time. So we're looking at a hybrid model where we could do two hour sessions Monday through Thursday, and then uh, annual passes um, and residents only Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Now, could folks who have an annual pass in our residents, so the annual pass would only be available to residents. Could they come in on those other days uh, right. for those two-hour sessions? We would, we would, uh, we would honor that. Right, um, right. And I, and I think, given the residents, that additional flexibility, um, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a viable thing to consider. I think it's worthwhile. It is, it is. And so we're looking at, you know, from annual passes, if say eighty percent of last year's resident annual passers. Um, Individuals who bought an annual pass were to buy one again this year. We're looking at somewhere around thirteen thousand for an operating cost that, on a normal year, is a hundred thousand. And this year, with the additional uh, facility improvements and the additional staff, we may be looking at one hundred and twenty-five thousand um, and out and and operating expense. Right. So the areas where we will make up some revenue would be the daily passes on Monday through. Thursday, which are not really the busiest day. The pool's busiest days are Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's right. when, you know, families have a day off or, you know, they make up time to go enjoy recreational activities. Right. Okay. Good. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Lisa? Lisa's, Lisa's got her hand up. Yeah. I just, I, I just want to comment that um, no matter what way you go with the financial model, that when the pool opens, there's a pass available for residents who only are lab swimming. That's important to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the things that I've heard from those individuals is they're, you know, they're, they're, they support the pool. They'll buy that annual pass, even though they know they're, they're won't use it like other users. And, but that's their contribution to the pool to have access to a pool. Okay, so just to wrap up the pool and looking at the other questions or comments that came up, um, just a clarification, Josue, on uh, you commented, and I don't know if you meant it this way, that there are extra people at the pool. Um, so are, are we hiring more people this year than we have in the past, or is that not what you meant? No, no, we, we've hired, we're hiring gate attendants. Um, something okay. that we did not need in the past. So in addition to the lifeguards, we have gate attendants that would um, help manage the flow of individuals and help with the maintenance of the facilities. Okay. And do you happen to have handy, because the question was what that, the cost was? The cost of the gate attendants is between $8.70 and, and $9 for the, for the gate attendants. Now, I also want to put the the employment of the pool as a workforce development activity. I think the, you know, one of the criticism that I've heard is that we're we're hiring minors and um, perhaps irresponsible minors, and and how do we expect them to do the pool enforcement? And that's just not the case. You know, we we do have minors, and but we our team is diligent about training them, empowering them, and ensuring they have the resources. So we have responsible young individuals who do work at the pool. They're getting a training, they're getting real life experience. Um, and so we're employing a lot of our local local youth in, in our program as well. So 
there's a, an added benefit and value to that. Okay, thanks, Osway. So I think the other thing, um, there are several questions around the restrooms, and I think these kind of go to, um, can we can we say anything more about, you know, based on the creative thinking that has been done, um, I mean, can we say something about when we would be ready um, for the uh, train station restrooms? Okay. Um, I see a statement on the on the on the on the window there, Brian, about can we borrow staff for pool staff to cover the cleaning and monitoring of the public restrooms? I no. think we've already addressed that. Okay. All right. Um, so they're, they're very different environments. So. Okay. Yes. Um, we we are working on this proposal that I mentioned earlier about. Lesser hours to accommodate staff, that's viable. Um, we're gonna explore the options uh, for that. We still need to check with our team and, and see if, um, if we can pull that off. So that it's, that it's um, an option, I hope. Maybe, maybe that's something that, that um, is doable, but we just, we're, we're not confident over it now. So we need, to, we need to continue to do more work on it. So, um... I guess what I'll say from my perspective is I appreciate that there's uh, a lot of focus on this and Jose already mentioned that we understand the challenges uh, with restrooms um, and, you know, again, that it's, you know, the messaging, not everybody pays attention. Um, but my sense is that we are going to figure out something as soon as possible um, related to uh, reopening those restrooms. I also know that, um, uh, there have been some other entities that have looked at support um, for the village doing that. So, um, so it is at the top of our um, top of our minds. Absolutely, Brian. And Brian, one of the things that I've also heard too is we are being compared with other counties in Ohio that have opened up their public restrooms, uh, and many of these are not being cleaned and supervised. Yes, mm -hmm. we know that that's happening, but we want to be responsible in how we open things. We can't just open things without the proper care and maintenance that um, that it requires because we have a responsibility to ensure safe safe or safer use of our of our all of our facilities <coughs> yep I agree all right and um okay I think the uh, there is a question about Verne um did you see that one, Josue? Um, so this is the one, I just lost it. Sorry, Brian, I was on mute. Are you referencing the question regarding the, will the village be having their volunteer experts analyze the results of Renee's uh, recent testing? Um, you know, we've had we've had the US EPA team review those review those tests, and they've also had a team of uh, outside experts. So I'm confident on the feedback that we're getting from the US EPA on this in terms of the CSAT standard and the methodology. Um, so I I don't see the need for an additional opinion on it. I mean, you know, if council requested an additional opinion we can go out and and get it from the professors who volunteer on this and experts who've worked on the environmental commission on this but i'm satisfied with the feedback that we're getting from the us epa on this Josue, you know that uh, i know mary i i think i am channeling my marianne but you know that group of people that worked on that commission are extraordinary experts and have been very involved. So I guess I was making the, I, I jumped to a conclusion that they had already seen this. I would like, I would like to engage that group. I think that group should be engaged to look at it. And this is the, the professors or the members from the Environmental Commission? Well, I, I apologize. Maybe Judy can help me understand. It's a subcommittee, I think, of that commission. So the subcommittee on their on our last meeting on May 27th, um, the meeting we had participation from Tom Dietrich and Marianne McQueen. So we do have 
the subcommittee member participation. Um, they have an opportunity to engage the, the project managers and the, the experts, the main experts with the US EPA as, as much as I do. Uh, so they've been a part of this process. Um, and then uh, a question came up about where are we at with the dog part. Um, is, is Johnny, do you want to say something briefly about that? I know I, we prioritized other things, but um, I don't know if you or Josue want to. I we are in still communication with the dog park. We've actually put it on hold a little bit until we get further out of this uh, pandemic, but we are still moving forward. We're just taking our time. We took a slowdown uh, so we could figure our what was priority and what was not priority, and we will be gearing back up in probably July with communications again. Thanks for that. And um, and the question was about the village paying. The one thing I want to highlight is that um, this is a citizen-led initiative that the village is supporting, um, um, but it's it's ultimately going to be um, funded by um, the folks that are going to be using it. Um, okay. And then I, I, I think that we're uh, close to, to wrapping things up, but I do want to, the other set of comments um, are, are mostly around um, face covering behavior in the village. Uh, Brian Carlson, Chief Carlson, since you are on the line, can you just briefly kind of talk about um, what, how the um, incident at the Spirited Goat was handled? and also any other observations that you have uh, related to that? Absolutely. Um, am I on? Can you guys hear me? Um, yep. So yes, yesterday we had uh, a couple officers respond to a small group gathered in front of the Spirited Goat. There were two young women who um, were exposing their breasts and we had several uh, concerning calls. Um, I do want to let everyone know that the in Ohio it is legal to um, have your uh, for females to have their breasts exposed. The law used to be that the nipples had to be covered, um, but it is not anymore. Um, if they're not causing a disturbance, um, in this case uh, they were because there was a large group in front of the uh, coffee shop. So I made the decision to compromise with the folks on scene, and there were maybe six or seven folks. They were videotaping the officers. Um, the compromise was that the um, female uh, persons would not dance up and down the sidewalk. They would just remain in place, and that folks would allow enough room for citizens to pass um, safely under the, uh, the guidelines of the, um, the governor's orders. So they did comply, although we received more calls and we made a couple trips out there and we worked uh, as, as best we could. Today I spoke with the proprietor of the coffee shop who I believe is opening tomorrow. And uh, he assured me that he is going to move the small picnic table that has been put in front of the store. That was problematic for me because if there were people seated there and toward the potted plant area by the street, it didn't allow any room for passersby. So that was taken care of there. We haven't received too many complaints about social distancing or mask wearing. I have to say that in town, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to see how many visitors, residents uh, wearing masks and um, behaving in an appropriate manner. If you have an issue with anyone that's not meeting the expectations uh, or it's causing discomfort for you, please contact the police department and we will do everything we can to assist but I urge you not to engage and just seek an alternate route, perhaps cross the street in a safe manner and come down the other sidewalk. That's the best advice we can give right now. We're having to weigh and decide uh, what battles we are, are choosing here in the department. So if that's a, a good way to put it, I hope. And, yeah. and Brian, yep. Brian um, we had a, a we had a the situation happen again today and there were fewer calls than yesterday. Is that right, Brian? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Um, well, I think, you know, the fact that, um, I mean, we, this is not officially on our agenda, but I just want to wrap up some current thoughts, um, and, and I appreciate what's been shared already. Um, first of all, being that, and, and I think maybe a good way to lead in, I have this daily calendar. It's actually got a really cute cat on it. But the quotation was ironic because it's from uh, Henry Ward Beecher saying, you and I don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. And um, I realize that uh, depending on what you're thinking, when we're downtown, um, we see different kinds of behavior. Um, I would say that I spent most of Saturday and Sunday downtown for a variety of reasons. And I saw, in many cases, a lot of lot mask wearing. When I moved away from groups that were on the sidewalk, I was thanked for doing that. And, and these were definitely folks that were from out of town. There was a lot of appreciation. I do think now that we have more signage and better messaging that that is having an impact. But I will also agree, sometimes I, I saw, you know, um, uh, there were times when there weren't a lot of masks being weared, worn. Um, there were, you know, some places where there was a little bit of gathering. And, um, you know, I appreciate some comments I saw around um, uh, what our officers are doing, and, and I think we'll continue to do to approach people in a positive and, and, uh, and calm way. And I think also, um, I talked to Josue about this earlier, we need to continue to think about um, when we see places where there's gathering, ways that we can um, add more space. Um, but just like with the pool, just like with everything else we're dealing with in these constantly changing times, um, it's, it's a work in progress. And I think the most important thing is that we continue to be responsive. With the pool, Josue has, has emphasized that if it's not working, then um, then we will close it. Um, and uh, I think, again, that we've all got to uh, understand that people are still learning what the behavior is. I think we all know that outside of Yellow Springs, mask wearing is very low. Um, and so the fact that we're seeing more and more people wear masks in town, I think is an important sign as people get acclimated. Um, but that being said, we will continue to, to monitor this, and if, if things get worse, then, um, then we will have to consider what kind of actions we take to uh, get on the right track to keep everyone safe. Um, so I think we're gonna move into future agenda items, um, unless there's, there's something that another council member uh, wants to say before we do that. Well, as a general comment, because I was downtown on the weekend as well, and, and I did see the group in front of the GOAT. And this is just a general comment. A lot of times people will call to complain about legal activity. And I wondered about the, the particularly the young, young women, and I was glad they were uh, exercising their right to do what they have a legal right to do. And I think, I hope dispatch can be trained to explain to callers or the police can explain, you know, we, police don't need to respond when people are doing things they legally are allowed to do. They don't have to go up and say, hey, we got a call. Maybe we need to tell the caller it's legal. And the other thing is people moving on the sidewalk, they're not, if as long as other people can move around them, even if distancing is a problem, they're doing the legal thing. It's people are stationary and blocking. So I just think we have to be really, I, I think we have to be really careful about telling people what to do or move along or you can't be here. I think if people, people have to cross the street to get where they need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. I'll just make a comment on that. And, and uh, Chief has issued instructions on how to re uh, respond to th these activities. So we're doing as much prevention on our end to at, at least informing customers and that's, uh, sorry, residents, informing our residents of what is uh, legal and what's not. And the guidelines have extended or what our team is doing have extended their informing uh, our residents of what's allowed in our, in our community. Um, we've had situations where folks have called the police on somebody smoking a cigarette. Um, 
and they, they use other identifying information that indicates that there's a bias there. And so our, our officers and dispatch um, are working on informing and educating our residents about what are some of these permissible activities and how do we respond to them. And that's a work in progress. Yep, thanks so much, Ray. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Lisa or Kevin, you good? Okay. Um, Lisa, did you want to say something? Okay, you're good. All right, um, so thanks everyone. I want to apologize again for the technical difficulties that we had at the beginning of the meeting. I apologize that that uh, affected some people with YouTube. Um, we will resolve those issues. And uh, again, please be patient with us. Um, but I do appreciate all the feedback that we got today. Um, and, and we will uh, capture all of those comments, but I think council has, has seen them. Um, so agenda planning, uh, anything that we need to think about for the uh, uh, next meeting? Did you want the recommendations for uh, landlord responsibility and about utility debt to come back to the next meeting? Possibly. Okay. Yeah, I'll write that down. Um, anything else? Are we gonna cover the uh, draft that Chris sent us or that we got from Chris, the draft resolution? Um, not until we put that on the agenda. Look it up. Uh, anything else? Nope. It seems like a lot. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I think one of the things here is we are, you know, catching up on things that we've pushed forward, but we also need to, you know, leave room for the urgent issues that are coming up with COVID. So, um, okay. Well, if nothing else, um, I, um, We'll make a motion to enter into executive session for the purpose of um, potential litigation. Do I have a second? I second that motion. Okay. Uh, Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Or do we? Judy, you're muted. Krieger. Yes. Hausch. Yes. Uh, Stokes. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We're uh, going into executive session, and uh, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just uh, on uh, instructions on how this is going to work, I'm going to create the breakout rooms. Executive session will be one room.